Good afternoon, and welcome to another Turnstile Tours virtual program. My name is Stephen D.W. I'm coming to you from the uh, Lenape lands that we now refer to as Flushing, Queens. And uh, today I uh, will be joined by Charlie DeRocco, uh, who was on our program not so long ago talking about uh, Titanic and his efforts to uh, bring a piece of the Titanic to uh, New York so it can finish its, uh, uh, its journey. Uh, that it uh, it's ill-fated journey but today uh, we're talking to Charlie uh, in his capacity as a marine engineer and uh, we're talking about a material that uh, that is common it's everywhere we pass it all the time even if you're inland it's a major part of our lives something we don't think about very often and that is wire rope of course here in New York wire rope is uh, uh, most significant in the bridges uh, uh, and in cranes, but uh, we'll, we'll be looking at it as an object lesson in through a ship that uh, graced our, our port for a long time. Now let's uh, bring in Charlie DeRocco and uh, we'll uh, talk, uh, excited to have you join us, Charlie, welcome. Thank you very much, Stefan, appreciate good, it. Good to see your face again. So we, were, uh, uh, we were talking uh, right before uh, we went live here about uh, all the ways that wire rope is used. I know you'll, you'll talk about how wire rope came about, but uh, you know, I, I can see wire rope out the window here, holding up telephone poles. Uh, you know, when uh, I uh, check in on the, the Waterfront Museum as a live stream video camera, so I can see the wire rope that holds up the, uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge every morning when I check in on that live stream. And, and of course the Brooklyn Bridge with its new bike lane has got attention on the wire rope there. And, and uh, you know, the, uh, the second most popular bird in New York after the pigeon is the crane and all those cranes uh, building up the new buildings are uh, wire rope, but, but you and I are nautical people. So we're interested in wire rope on ships. And of course you're, uh, you were last year with uh, talking about the Titanic. Uh, what are ways that wire rope was used on the Titanic? Well, obviously uh, the Titanic being another, uh, you know, just another ship essentially, uh, Wire rope was used on board for the standing rigging for the uh, for the masts, uh, the funnel guys, and uh, for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, crane derricks that they had on on uh, on board. And also, they had a large boom aft of the uh, of the foremast, and that also was rigged had a topping lift and falls with the wire rope. So the uh, are, are what are the fall guys exactly? Uh, the falls are 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 the uh, uh, the tackles that hang off the end of a boom or a davit. It's what the load is actually picked up with. Got it. Got it. And do you have any sense of how those elements of the Titanic are are holding up in in that extreme environment on the bottom of the ocean? I would suspect that they're you know they're practically gone. Uh, you know, at this point, there may be some remnants around. Uh, a lot of times what they did with the uh, wire rope to preserve it back then is that they uh, uh, they slushed it first with uh, white lead and then they wrapped it and then they uh, they served it with with a light line to make it, uh, uh, you know, weatherproof. And uh, so maybe that some of that white lead may be down there and some of the wire may be, may be preserved. Well, uh, you throw a lot of terms and, and images at us that we'll, we'll get into in, in greater detail in just a moment. Uh, and just to remind folks, uh, your your what what is the this project that you're doing with the Titanic? Oh, the uh, uh, the project is called the Quiet Sea, and it is uh, the purpose is to bring uh, the salvaged whole section of Titanic to New York, where it's never been, so that the ship can symbolically uh, complete her maiden voyage. Great. Well, I'm sure and we got uh, that. Uh, uh, Andrew just dropped that link into the chat there so people can check that out at their leisure. But let's uh, let's get into our conversation here about uh, uh, wire rope. And, and you uh, spent a lot of time working with wire rope in very particular circumstances associated with this vessel, which uh, is near and dear to a lot of hearts around New York, but uh, this, uh, what, uh, set, set the scene for us. What, uh, what is this that we're talking about where we're going to, what is vessel for discussing uh, wire rope that we're looking at today? Well, when Peking arrived in New York, uh, she, she still had a lot of her original uh, wire rope. Uh, some new lengths were added when, when the additional, uh, 
uh, masts were put up up on top. You had the sub gallant and the roll masts were missing. So they were installed and they received new lengths of wire rope. But most of the, of the wire that was on board was, uh, was original from 1911. And uh, so after nearly three quarters of a century, it was, uh, it was in a very dangerous condition. So, so the, the Peking, I mean, as I remember it from my very early youth, it was just this massive ship that really dominated the historic ship wharfs at South Street Seaport. Uh, and it was, uh, it was just uh, unbelievably huge presence. Uh, and uh, it went away, uh, was that 2014, 2015? When, when did it leave the harbor? Yeah, I really don't rightly recall, uh, but yeah, it was it was it was about four or five years ago, I guess. Yeah, so a few years ago, and uh, we left the harbor because uh, it it went home, as I recall. And there were people were pretty upset that this, this iconic ship that had been here, because this is one of the first ships that South Street Seaport acquires. Is that correct? Uh, well, they already had the Waver Tree uh, okay. and and the Ambrose and the Liddy Howard. And the pioneer, uh, but uh, uh, they got the Peking. Uh, it was 1974, I guess, and it was, um, you know, the reasoning behind getting such a large and complex vessel uh, uh, sort of escaped me at the time. But you know, nevertheless, they, uh, you know, they got the Peking. I mean, they had, you know, we had our hands full with the waiver tree. And uh, you know, so this other vessel comes along, and it, uh, you know, it was it really strained the resources of the place. In my sense, of just uh, catching ships and uh, that keeping them from going away at that time. And uh, you know, there was the Alexander Hamilton was in the docks around then too. And yeah, uh, yeah they had the Mashulu. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. So they had the Mashulu there briefly uh, right. in the early seventies. So, uh, but this ship did not have a relationship with New York before it got here, as I understand it. No, no, she was a uh, she was a nitrate ship, uh, ran down to you know from Europe down to uh, South America and back again, pretty much. Uh, so she never had a real trade relationship with the United States. All right. So, New York. Uh, so it was built in, and you said 1911. It was built. That's correct. 1911. And so uh, going down to South America and obviously uh, uh, a, a steel hull and it's just massive vessel carrying right. bulk cargo. And uh, where was it when South Street Seaport got hold of it? Uh, she was in England. She uh, wound up uh, being their training vessel, stationary training vessel for the Shaftesbury School, which was like, you know, sort of a school for, for homeless um, uh, and orphan kids. Uh, I know some people that 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 were Arethusa boys. Um, one of them being Richard Futrell, who was uh, uh, the director of the Waver Tree Restoration in the '70s, and uh, and some other friend. Peter Swift is another friend of mine who was an Arethusa boy back then. Um, so those boys were trained to either go into the merchant service or learn a trade uh, where you know they could they could have a job and be uh, you know, be good citizens of Britain. And uh, in the were they, so were they working on the maintaining the ship while they were uh, in this institution? Yeah, yeah, they yeah they did uh, uh, some ship maintenance. A lot of the uh, uh, you know she was a school, so there was a lot of classroom work. Uh, they learned uh, you know learned about compasses and about navigation. And also uh, other trades, they learned mathematics. But it was it was a, it was reported as being a well-rounded education for kids who otherwise would you know would have you know not had any chance at all. Sure. And we get a great sense in this image from, uh, of how much rigging. So all these sort of diagonal lines are these all wire rope that we're looking at here? Right. That's correct. Right. And then it came to New York, and I guess we got a couple photos as clearly uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge with uh, Staten Island here in the background. Right. Uh, and uh, so, so South Street Seaport acquired it and added it to their, their large collection. 
Yeah, yeah. She wound up uh, first going to Staten Island. Um, now, the, you know, that's the condition when she arrived in New York, and she uh, uh, she first went to Brewer Shipyard in Staten Island. Uh, I I was working up in Massachusetts at the time, and and I heard she had arrived, so I came down to have a look at the thing over in the shipyard, and uh, uh, you know, wound up getting hired on the spot by a gentleman named Bob Herbert who was the first, uh, the first director of the restoration uh, of uh, Peking. So uh, you know, I had to go back up to Massachusetts and get my stuff and come back down again. Wow. So, uh, Yeah, we got a real sense of the size of the ship here. And also, let's go back to that last photo for a moment again, talking about wire rope. And here we have the Verizon Narrows and all of its wire rope. Uh, right. Once you start looking, comes up everywhere. Now, these days, as I understand, these hawsers, these long lines that connect tugboats to, uh, to ships uh, are made of a synthetic material, which is just extraordinarily strong. Uh, in the 70s, was that material around or are we also, are we looking at natural material or, or, or are we looking at wire rope in this case? Yeah, you're certainly looking at a wire rope hawser there. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the advantage of that is um, you know you've got some weight, so the weight provides some catenary, which keeps the, the uh, hawser in, in the water to reduce the shock load uh, for the uh, tow. And the uh, uh, so that's certainly wire rope, yes. And right, now, so this is as I gather a very old piece or a replica of a very old piece of jewelry, uh, and this kind of gets us back to the the origins of of. Uh, Metal wire. What said? Take us into that story. What? Where does metal wire come from? Uh, what? How has it uh, become so such a, an essential part of our world? Um, well, well, the working of wire rope uh, of, of of metal into wire, rather, uh, it's 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 a pretty ancient skill. Uh, gold and bronze and copper were, were all beat into uh, into wire, and initially for jewelry. So you can see, uh, you know, this piece of Pompeian jewelry there has has what appears to be some very fine uh, uh, gold that's hammered into wire, uh, and uh, they were found uh, uh, found among uh, excavations in Egypt and in Pompeii. There's evidence of uh, you know of wire rope jewelry, um, but uh, for trade use, for commercial use, for heavy use. You certainly need something stronger than gold, gold, silver, or, or bronze. Uh, so until the event of uh, malleable uh, wrought iron, which could be produced in quantity, uh, there was no practical way to make uh, commercial wire rope prior to the 19th century. So here we're looking at uh, part of Germany. How did this uh, uh, these mountains... Uh, uh, how did they figure into the story of wire rope, the Hartz Mountains? Well, uh, there were silver mines down in 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 the uh, Hartz Mountains, which is the circle area there. And uh, uh, for hoisting equipment, uh, you know, for for, for haulage ropes uh, in those wet conditions, uh, anything like uh, hemp or Manila would just rot out pretty quickly. So German mining engineers actually developed. Uh, the 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 spiral stranded wire rope uh, in the uh, early part of the 19th century. So the the origins suggest that uh, uh, that the the uh, silver mines in Harz Mountain mountains uh, was really the first practical use uh, of of wire rope in in an industry. Uh -huh. Uh, for marine use, oh, well, okay, right. there's uh, uh, dead eyes and lanyards, all of hemp. You know, the standing rigging is uh, is hemp, and the uh, and the lines between the dead eyes, there, the lanyards are all hemp as well. Uh, and again, you have the the uh, situation of uh, of longevity and strength, uh, where wire rope. Uh, you know, completely it's, exceeds the strength of any any kind of hemp material. To have an equivalent amount of strength, you'd have to have unduly large diameter um, 
uh, hemp or have the lines braided together, cable laid is called, uh, to make a very large rope, which becomes impractical. So the, 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 first, uh, uh, the first record of uh, wire rope being used on a, um, uh, on a vessel was on the English schooner, schooner Marshall uh, in the uh, mid-1830s. And a few years later, the, uh, there was an experimental iron ship called the John Garrow was built in Aberdeen. And she was fitted out with, with uh, uh, wire rope or standing rigging of wire rope, rather. So the two, um, uh, the two uh, manufacturers at the time uh, were Andrew Smith in, uh, in uh, Liverpool and um, uh, Robert Townsend. Uh, and Samuel Wickersham in Pittsburgh, uh, but in America, the the um, the um, uh, use of wire rope was was still in its infancy and limited to uh, making carding combs for wool and 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 for fine fine mesh uh, sieves, uh, you know, for sifting sifting you know, Wire here still. We're not quite to the point of, of wrapping it together into something of a larger diameter. Is that right? Right, right, exactly. And, and looking at this picture here, you're talking about how much the, how the hemp rots away so quickly. You know, I think about early texts about sailing, and it seems like they spend a lot, if not most of their time, uh, waterproofing a standing rigging, you know, by, you know, putting tar into things. Uh, and do, is that... Uh, was that part of, uh, you know, was that so a labor that was saved when they moved into wire rope or was that still part of their, uh, is that still part of the maintenance of wire rope? And how much, how much were they spending time maintaining and waterproofing materials compared to uh, with natural materials? Well, you still want to weatherproof it. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, like I said before, you had, uh, you know, wire rope was uh, uh, usually coated with white lead. And, and then served, you know, to protect it, then the serving was tarred, um, but, but it was a lot less frequent. So it, it, it reduced the maintenance uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, of keeping the rigging, uh, you know, waterproof. Uh, so, it, you know, it was a big labor saving uh, uh, point there. Plus you had the strength, uh, you know, of the uh, wire, which uh, far superior to the hemp. Here we go. This is the guy I think of when I think of wire rope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Roebling. The 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 first wire ropes that were manufactured were sort of done in a traditional way, uh, like in a rope walk. Maybe uh, uh, some of the attendees may have been up to Mystic to see the rope walk in Mystic, and it's a very long, uh, long open hallway that. Uh, that uh, the, the individual fibers and strands of the rope are stretched out and twisted up. Um, so wire rope was initially built that way, but it wasn't very practical uh, in that you couldn't really maintain the tension of each of the parts and each of the strands. Uh, so John Roebling and his mechanics in Trenton um, uh, built, uh, uh, built a wire rope uh, uh, winding machine that was essentially looked like a, a, a turret that had a series of bobbins around the perimeter, each one holding a small strand of wire. And they were all led through a die and the whole thing revolved and, and twisted the uh, wires very uniformly into the compact shape that we know as a wire rope. So you see, so uh, I mean, I, and I'm so glad you mentioned Mystic and their, their uh, rope walk because uh, it's been years since I, I, I know Andrew is saying here that he just visited uh, Mystic recently and, and the rope walk there was amazing. Yeah, that's the one thing, you know, as much as I love all the ships and they have a lot of boats there, uh, the thing that really stuck stuck with me was the, the rope walk, just how extraordinary that was. And you know, there are great uh, YouTube videos out there about rope walks. But you described Roebling's rope walk as uh, his or his wire rope uh, jig as a turret. Uh, does that mean it was operating vertically rather than horizontally? Uh, yes, it, it, yeah, it did operate vertically. I think there is one, I think there's still one out in Trenton, I believe. Uh, in one of the museums out there, 
Uh, I think the Society of Industrial Archaeology, if you look it up there, I think you may locate it. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, the, the, the second advantage is that, is, is that it didn't take up uh, as much length uh, as a rope walk, or, you know, a rope walk would be, uh, you know, if they were making uh, uh, full coils, that was a 1,200 foot, uh, you know, rope walk, which is huge. I think the one in Mystic is is half that length, or or maybe even a third. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a, another program we could get into. As you get into some of the yeah. old parts of New York, uh, you start seeing these rope walks come up, and yeah, they're they're real estate intensive for sure. Oh yeah, definitely. So you know, in in the in the space of one traditional rope walk, you could have a number of these uh, you know these winding machines. And, uh, you know, you can produce uh, a number of wire rope uh, simultaneously. All right, so now we're talking about other ships. This is one we've uh, visited before for other stories. Uh, and uh, uh, this is perhaps not how we think of the Merrimack with sails, but, but here it is. Uh, yep. How does the Merrimack fit into uh, your wire rope story? Well, uh, John Roebling was trying to convince the, uh, you know, the government and especially the Navy, obviously, of the advantages of, uh, of wire rope over hemp rigging. So he had, uh, uh, he, he was trying to convince them to, um, uh, to let him rig these uh, new steam screw frigates, the Merrimack and the Minnesota, they were sister vessels, uh, with uh, a standing rigging of his wire rope. But the Navy was uh, very conservative and didn't didn't trust trust any new material. But but uh, a after a series of tests toward the end of the Civil War, uh, they showed the superiority of uh, wire rope over over hemp rigging, and uh, so that kind of made a believer out of the uh, uh, Navy. And by the 1870s, um, every every naval vessel that was launched was was fitted with rolling wire rope, you know, which of course made him quite wealthy. And here we have the uh, Prussian, the uh, probably you know the ultimate expression of wire rope on a uh, on a windjammer, uh, over 400 feet long, uh, to carry uh, uh, about 8,000 tons of cargo, you know, displace about 11, 12,000 tons. And the beauty of uh, steel spars and uh, wire rope uh, was that these ships could uh, uh, could use a lot of the uh, strong winds in the Southern Ocean without having to take in sail all the time. So they were they were pretty much designed to uh, you know to run during heavy gales. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. have to take in a few sails. Uh, you know, like the you know the upper ones, uh, you know, the Royals and upper to gallons, but. Uh, Basically, they could they you know they could carry a huge amount of sail, and uh, have quite a high uh, average speed that was uh, competitive with powered vessels of the day. So uh, she she and her other uh, flying P line, the German flying P line, Sister Potosi, uh, which was a big five masted bark, uh, and other large uh, uh, large steel sparred wire rigged uh, vessels uh, really were were the, uh, you know, the ultimate expression of, uh, you know, of uh, uh, com commercial sale. And uh, I think probably if it weren't for the First World War and, you know, and then the Second World War, I, I, I think it was probably a practical for the uh, development of these vessels to continue. Wow. Yeah, there's sort of an irony here that uh, the same, uh, which I, I think you know, a lot of us are conscious of, that the same technologies that were making that were making these sailing vessels obsolete were also making it possible for them to extend the technology and improve it to where they can stay competitive in certain bulk markets. Uh, so Fine. it's yeah. really fascinating to see how far they were pushing it. And, uh, and of course, now with our concerns for reducing emissions, we're revisiting sail in a different way with uh, a new age of materials. Right. And the, the, you know, you know, another little note about that is that the German uh, hydrographic offices uh, starting back in the 1800s uh, um, re required that every uh, ship's log record what wind they found where. 
latitude and longitude. And what they did was they compiled uh, these uh, uh, sailing charts that showed the best wind in the best places so that you could you know, maintain as consistent a speed as possible. Uh, Prussian herself was lost after she was rammed by a steamer uh, in 1910 in the English Channel. Uh, the uh, uh, steamer misjudged the Prussian speed and tried to cut ahead of her and the uh, uh, Prussian couldn't, couldn't maneuver quickly enough to get out of the way. So she wound up uh, uh, ramming the steamer and knocking her, uh, you know, knocking her bowsprit off and damaging her bow and her foremast. Then she was helpless, and uh, you know that was about it. Wow, uh, ordinary story. Yeah. Well, now uh, we're we're getting to our halfway mark, and here we are now uh, in uh, recent history when the Peking was still here in New York. Right. So here, here we have the uh, you know Peking as a four master bark, uh, a very lofty. Uh, you know, uh, masts, uh, and she she was rigged with wire rope uh, the, from bow to stern. The foremast would be the be the foremast, the mainmast, uh, the mizzen, and the jigger. And here you can see the arrangement of the uh, of the standing rigging, uh, the shrouds port and starboard, and the headstay is going fore and aft, uh, and the backstay is coming coming diagonally down from the masts uh, on the after side of the masts. So it's, it's a triangulated system. Uh, you know, it's a very complex system. And uh, when these vessels were in operation, it was very important to have, have the loads distributed uh, as equitably as possible over all these wires. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm still sorting out all of these wires. You know, we, for, for those who haven't studied these things, we look at ships and it just seems like a, a, a rat's nest of, of lines going everywhere. Uh, and you know, I've come to appreciate that artists of the sailing age you know, knew what those lines were and were very careful in, in, duck, in, in you know, uh, depicting them and very exacting in that. Whereas, you know, for those of us who don't know, it just seems like a whole bunch of, of lines, almost cross hatching. Uh, and, and that's perhaps another program to go into exactly how that works, but uh, it may be important to note that, you know, these, uh, these booms that we're seeing here uh, would get turned in different directions depending on your relationship with the wind and even parts of the mass, like this is, a, it could lower this part of the mass, is that correct? Uh, yeah, you could take down the, yeah, the upper portion of the mask is, is uh, yeah, it can be, can be sent down uh, in these later ships, the, uh, uh, the lower mast and the uh, top mast above it uh, uh, were, uh, were in one piece, now, which made them much stronger uh, the, you know, than to have, have a separate section that was doubled. Uh, but the top gallant mast up, 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 uh, uh, the highest spar could be, could be lowered down. And then we also have, so we have lines that are just keeping those masts upright. We have lines that are changing the orientation of these booms. Right. Uh, and, uh, and is there, and then we also have, all well, there, the lines, we also have lines going between the masts to help keep them upright. Is there anything we're missing there? Are other, other jobs that uh, I've, I've overlooked? Well, when sail would be bent on the yards uh, and on the stays in the uh, case of the fore and aft uh, stays in the, Gibbs and Stasels, you would have all, all the associated lines that were uh, part of handling the sails to, to set them and to, uh, and to furl them. So, uh, so there, there's uh, uh, e each, each yard would have, uh, you know, at least, you know, a dozen additional lines uh, to help handle the sail on that particular yard. Uh, and then, of course, the lower corners of the sails would be uh, uh, hauled down. The sheets would be hauled down. In the case of the lowest sails on the lowest yards, they'd go right to the deck. In the case of the upper uh, sails, they would go to the yard arm uh, that was directly below it and then, then wind up being led to the deck through blocks and uh, fairlies. So it was a very complex system, but it was so well organized that uh, uh, that 
you know, the seamen on deck knew where to find all this stuff, uh, you know, in the middle of the night. So. And lines that we don't see that were attached to the sails, were those also wire rope or were they other materials? Uh, some were. Uh, some were wire rope, some were uh, hemp and some were manila, you know, depending on their use. Um, and uh, the sails the themselves, uh, the sails on these latter day vessels would, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the leeches uh, would be, you know, so the size of the sails would be wire rope. Uh, and that would give them a lot of strength. Uh, you know, uh, the buttlands, which were lines used to hold the sails up and clulins, which were used to hold the corners up, were also, in many cases, uh, wire rope. And I, I hope everyone's just loving all this vocabulary of bunt lines and coolings and everything yeah, else. Yeah, it's a little, little much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Another perspective uh, with some more yeah. vocabulary. Yeah, so, so from right to left, you've got the, uh, 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 the, head, the head stays there. Uh, and right, and then then you've got a heavy diagonal uh, wire going forward there, and that's that would be the forestay. And then you've got the five shrouds, which are going up there, right? And then the next two are, are two cap stays, right? And then you then the next three are the topmast back stays, and then the next one is the is the uh, topmast cap stay. And then you've got uh, two uh, to gallant stays. And then all the way on the left, you've got the royal stay, royal back stay. There's a lot. Yeah. But so yeah. some of these are all like they're in place and they're, they're uh, these are things you're not adjusting particularly. Right, they, uh, they can be adjusted, but they're not adjusted on a daily basis or, uh, you know, usually, you know, usually adjusted if the ship is uh, uh, downrig, but generally when they're put into uh, a certain amount of tension, uh, the the rigging screws of the turnbuckles on the bottom are locked by a uh, uh, by a bar, so they can't unscrew. And then these are these the dead eyes that we saw in the drawing a little while ago. Uh, that's the modern equivalent. Those are on these ships. They were called thimbles. Uh, there were there were two types of thimbles. There's a round thimble, as as is on the Peking, and then on the Wavy Tree, which is uh, you know which is an earlier vessel. The thimbles were actually heart shaped, and um, uh, the 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 advantage to a round thimble is that it will allow some self adjustment, whereas a hard thimble, if if there is some slack in the wire, the hard thimble will rotate and then it will sort of jam up. On, on one side of the eye. So round thimbles became more popular because they were less, uh, you know, less harmful to the wire. All right. so, so we're dealing with all this wire cable and, and it, it required a lot of work when you got it, I gather. Yeah, this is a photograph of, uh, you know, the condition of, uh, uh, you know, the wire rope not long after she arrived in New York, you can see the, the uh, you know, the heavy wires themselves up, up on the upper portion there, you can see there's broken wires inside, a lot of fish hooks in there. And then you've got the two, two little ropes there that are poking out. That, those are the worming, uh, which are the lines that are used to fill the crevices between the, the wire. And then the uh, the uh, wire going across the uh, the, the binding wire is called the seizing going across that that that's called the round seizing and that that was heavily deteriorated and uh, then of course to the left you've got the serving or the service and that that's suffering from the weather as well now the 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 this this particular shroud uh, came off the foremast. Uh, and and generally the foremast shrouds uh, suffered the most because they got all the uh, spray back from the bow, and, you know they you know they were always doused in salt water. So uh, so these were especially uh, bad. But well, one of these wires parted uh, on a on a very calm day. Uh, the uh, the jigger stay uh, parted 
uh, and uh, uh, a bunch of hardware came down on the deck. And uh, so that, that, that kind of fortified my argument uh, that this, uh, you know, this thing needs to be re-rigged. That was, you know, I'm glad no one got hurt, but, 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 but in a way it was, uh, you know, it was a uh, necessary and dramatic need for my argument. Out of everybody's attention, it sounds like. And uh, boy, yeah, this is a few years ago. That is that you on the left? That's me on the left, and uh, the fellow on the right is Stevie Geis. And we we were working on the wave retreat at the time. This is uh, this is probably 1978, I guess, and we're seizing a cap stay for um, for the main lower mast. Um, and uh, so we you know, we have the rigging vice there, we have the thimble, and uh, Steve is winding the, the wire, which you can see in the closest to the, the vice. And uh, as he's uh, winding the, the uh, uh, serving board, which is in his hand there, just diagonal dark uh, uh, piece of wood above the, the uh, seizing, and I'm hammering each, each, uh, each turn and, uh, and uh, passing the wire. So underneath it, there's some canvas wrapping the, uh, the uh, wrapped around the uh, cables there that that you know allows you to lay on the uh, the uh, seizing and and to pass it. So the so the secret here is to keep everything as tight as tight as possible. And uh, when you finish it off, you have those little cross turns, both wrapping turns. And each one of those is is hove down. Uh, you know, you get it right down as tight as you possibly can without breaking a wire. And uh, you know, then you lock it up, and the thing is in place. It's um, uh, this four seasons on a doubling, and generally, uh, in if if they're really done well, they're they're stronger than a splice because when you splice a wire you're interrupting the strands and, and creating a lot of weak points. But here you preserve the full diameter of the cable. And if properly done, these, uh, you know, the, you know, these seasons really do the job. It's uh, take a little over a year ago when we had Frank Hanavan, uh, who's been involved in some rigging and he was on here talking about knots and uh, mentioned some of the things you're talking about here. All yeah, right. This, this looks pretty ugly. What are we looking at here? Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the uh, this is the main Tagalan mast on the Peking, and you can see the those two uh, the horn horn like shape there is um, is uh, uh, well. There's a stay that goes around it, the uh, top gallon stay, uh, which has scarred the mast up. So the thumb cleat there's a there's another thumb cleat on the uh, left side, which is partially visible on the bottom there. And so those two just support the wire from sliding down on the mast. Uh, so in way of the mast, once we cut this wire down, um, you can see that the mast is whole and uh, and damaged. And actually, we had a lot of we had some critical damage on the forward to gallant mast, uh, and uh, the mast was leaning forward a few degrees. Uh, so the the lower portion of it was failing. And uh, um, the uh, uh, the area that was that that was really uh, uh, damaged was the upper portion of the uh, of the Thomas, the four Thomas. So we got uh, you know we built some uh, um, uh, some rests up there and got got a fifty ton jack and uh, uh, gently jacked the mast back. We got some of it. We didn't get all of it because the internal framing had been distorted slightly. Uh, there's three angles that run longitudinally in the, uh, uh, you know, to help stiffen the mast. And they, they were uh, slightly buckled. So there was no way we were gonna get, get them straight again, but, but we did, did gain a little bit on it. And, and, uh, and, and we were able to double uh, the, uh, you know, add, add some steel plates and double it up so it wouldn't come crashing down. And just to be clear, because our last photo you said was a uh, waiver tree, which is still with us and, and right. it looks like it's doing really well. Uh, but my eyes are not that well informed, so who knows? But uh, this is this waiver tree or is this Peking that we're looking at here? 
This is Peking. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. And here you can see the uh, the area that was repaired. This is the after side of the uh, Fort Thomas on Peking. This uh, and, and the double plates go all around the mast. Uh, but this was the uh, area that was that was failing. So it was. Uh, if it wasn't a close call, it certainly would have been in about a year, I suspect. Wow. No, and I, and I, and it carries a lot of weight. You know, it carries the to gallon mast, it carries the uh, uh, the two to gallon yards, and it carries the roll yard, and then all their associated standing rigging. So, so it was probably about uh, ten or twelve tons uh, resting on that on that uh, area that was deteriorating. Wow. And again, really complicated piece of design here with all these wire ropes coming in all these stays and and. Uh, right. Uh, uh, pieces of structure just all to keep it upright uh, in all these these really uh, rigorous conditions. Oh, there's a blast of the past there with the old uh, festival uh, market, which is uh, long gone now. Oh yeah, right, right. right. So uh, so the foyer, it, it's a little hard to see, but you know you can see the new paint out toward the end there by that by that uh, stirrup that's coming down the foot rope, uh, the, uh, no, a little further out. Uh, uh, yeah, out, out, out for, there you go. Right, that, that area uh, under a band, the yard was, was, was badly holed and wasted. So we had some, you know, we had some um, concerns there. And, and in that case, it was the end of the yard falling off. So, uh, which of course was over the pier and not, not, not really good for visitors. So we uh, made a temporary strong bag just to secure it and uh, took that band off. Uh, we, we took a spare gangway and set it up under the yard so we have a good stable platform to work from. And uh, uh, so we took the band off, uh, got the plate rolled, uh, we put it up there and we, and we welded a doubler on and then, then made a new band for the for the uh, you know for that portion of the yard, the steel band. So she she had a number of things that were uh, you know of grave concern, but but I I I was I was probably the happiest guy in New York to see that old 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 ship go to Germany. Uh, uh, so it wasn't on your hands anymore, or uh, what? Why was that? Well, no, they, you know they you know that was long after I I had left uh, you know the museum in '98. Um, so, uh, uh, no, just, just, just because the ship was not, you know, the ship was deteriorating and it was, uh, you know, and the, you know, the spars were, you know, were bad enough, but you had a lot of trouble with the hull. And, uh, you know, so she was, you know, she was a great ship and she was going down to tubes, you know, just sitting there. So, uh, so when they did this job out in, over in Hamburg there, I was, I was, I was tickled pink. It sounds like they've been taking really great care of it and doing great work with it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. It seems like the community is really behind it, which of course makes a huge difference. Uh, it's it's a charismatic boat. It's hard not to get excited about it, but it's easier, uh, uh, even even harder not to get excited about it when it's your your own from your own home. And it was built in Hamburg. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. Right. Yeah, Blom and Voss. Yeah. Um, so here we have the uh, four stay rigging screws. And uh, all the hardware for the standing rigging was all this dismantled and serviced and uh, uh, wasted areas like, uh, you know, the fork that's around the thimble there uh, on the upper portion of the rigging screw. The, that was all, yeah, yeah, that you know, was all uh, uh, built up with weld and then, and then annealed and, uh, and put back uh, the... We had, uh, you know, we had to uh, break all these, all these, uh, all these turnbuckles. They were so heavily rusted. Uh, it was, it was a real, you know, you had a ten-foot bar with three or four um, strong men on it, uh, and a lot of heat. Uh, you know, getting these things uh, uh, orange hot. Uh, and and then slowly and penetrating oil and slowly they'd give it up and uh, 
but it was, you know, we, you know, we didn't break anything. Thank goodness. That was my fear that we would, you know, you know, we'd destroy something and then have to make a new one. But, um, uh, you know, but it all turned out pretty well. It took a lot of patience to do it, but, but it got done. With, with all of the, I, I, I think one of the, and we'll get into this more in just a moment here, but the most striking aspects to me of the work you're doing here is the amount of creativity and uh, innovation that re it's required to deal with these huge problems. And uh, of course, we've been talking a lot, at least, uh, you know, I, I've been paying a lot of attention to the progress of our infrastructure bill going through Congress and, uh, you know, thinking about wire rope being you know, in, in bridges and, uh, and all these other pieces of infrastructure. Uh, you know, I don't, it sounds like this was a ship that was, you know, up until the time the South Street Seaport got it was you know, seeing some maintenance, maybe not as much as it wanted, but uh, it, it makes me wonder about, you know, what it's going to take to uh, keep all of our bridges uh, uh, and everything else that our infrastructure that uses wire rope like this, how, what, what it's going to take to get it up to snuff. You know, I understand a lot of these things are not in great condition. I don't know if there's a comparison to the state that Peking was when you were working on it, but uh, but it's really a, a tremendous effort that you seem to put into this. Yeah, you know, you're trying to catch up, and uh, you know, like the you know the Brooklyn Bridge to work on a Manhattan Bridge. You know, a number of years ago they were talking about replacing the Williamsburg Bridge, and uh, you know, one could imagine. So they decided that you know that wasn't one; it wasn't practical, and and. Two, you've already got a bridge here. Just take care of it. So you know, you, you know, deferred maintenance is, uh, um, you know, it's 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 a cheap way to destroy something. So. Well, let's uh, let's keep looking at how you you kept this up here. Let's see, there we go. So we got our bowsprit with the FDR drive. Right, and uh, so in the bow, so all this hardware, the rigging screws, and uh, all this gear uh, was was uh, was dismantled and repaired. And the, the first, uh, the uh, these four bowsprit guys, you see two on the right, and I can two on the left there. They painted white uh, to uh, simulate white lead, but. Um, uh, yeah, but all this hardware got uh, got heavy uh, heavy maintenance and heavy repair. And um, uh, but these four wires were the first ones that went up. Uh, you yeah, know, we figured they you know they're the easiest ones to do. So so you know you know we're going to have a learning curve. So let's uh, let's start here. And uh, you know we did some work on the bowsprit as well. Uh, the big uh, stay with the fork there is the big heavy four stay. And uh, the hardware where it, it attached to the uh, to the bowsprit all had to come come out. And there, there's a pin that goes right through the bowsprit. There's a shiv on each side to 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 fairly the wire back to to the two rigging screws that are by the bulkhead. There uh, it's called the knight's plate, knight head plate. But um, but those. Um, uh, those Fairlead shivs uh, had to come out. They, they were destroyed and shot. But there's a bolt that goes right through the bowsprit. So getting that thing out was a, you know, I had to build jigs and jacks and blah, 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 and this and that. Um, and heating the bowsprit as much as we practically could with the equipment we had it took time. But eventually that got repaired. I, I think I made uh, two new shivs on a lathe for the, uh, you know, for the forest day. I know I got a couple of pictures coming up of other innovations, and uh, but this looks like we're getting back to sort of just uh, elbow grease here. Who is this, and, and uh, what is he doing? Uh, that is uh, that is Lars Hansen. Uh, Lars Lars Hansen was uh, was a rigger for Banks Rigging for many years in the uh, harbor. He's Danish. Uh, he. Uh, uh, Emigrated to the United States after the Second World War. He was in the Danish resistance during the war. And um, uh, he was, uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess the best word to describe me is he was a giant. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was a man of iron and had a heart of gold, I guess is the best way you could put him. 
He was, he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, so we had this problem. The uh, right above him, you can see the upper top gallant yard, and you know it's kind of medium, you know, medium sized yard. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you can see the size of it. Yeah, you know, it's you know it's still formidable. So when the ship first got this gear in uh, 1975, 1976, this particular uh, piece he's working on, the yard crane there, uh, which which uh, holds up the uh, lower top gallant yard, which you can see to the extreme right of the picture, was put on upside down. So uh, we were figuring a way to do this without having to get a crane in because we couldn't afford a crane for one thing. And, but, but, but it just looked so awful, we, uh, we had to do something about it. So every morning, Lars and I would get together, we'd talk about day's work or whatever, this and that. And he came up with this idea. He said, well, if we, if we reinforce the upper top gallant yard to the mast, and then we support the lower top gallant yard to the upper top gallant yard and to the mast, and, uh, uh, we can probably disconnect it and uh, rotate the crane. You know, I have to burn all the wells off, uh, rotate the crane and put it right side up. So his, his, uh, his confidence was, was uh, yeah, he was, he was completely confident. I, I had my doubts. My concern was the lower tub gallon yard getting away from us somehow. But he was, uh, he was confident. And, uh, you know, if he was confident, that was good enough for me. So we built the staging up there to work from. And you can see the, uh, the, the, the portion there that's blackened is the, is the, uh, uh, is the topmost cap. That's a separate piece of iron that's riveted to the top of the uh, uh, topmost. And uh, so what he proposed was, you can see the burn marks and a little bit of a bevel uh, on the edge of the crane and on the uh, Thomas cap. So the idea was we'd heat everything up, get the pin out of there, and then rotate the thing and put it in uh, properly, uh, rotate it 180 degrees and reinsert the pin. So that's what we did. And it was, uh, uh, the first one was really nerve wracking, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I had a good gang and, uh, you know, they, you know, they had every, every, every confidence. And we went slowly and carefully and deliberately and, uh, and, uh, you know, made the correction. So, and uh, the expression on Lars's face uh, sort of says it all, uh, you know, it's kind of like when he was the happiest. <laughs> I want to get back to the discussion of wire rope, and we only have a couple of minutes left here. So, uh, so finally, getting to our definition of uh, some terms here: the worming and parceling. So, this is uh, right. can you tell us what that was about, and you help us understand that a little better? Okay. Well, uh, if you're looking at the uh, wire rope itself, uh, each each uh, 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 each depression between each each uh, lay. Is, is filled with a little rope that's called worming to make the, the, the uh, uh, you know, the rope level. And then you've got uh, 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 cotton or uh, linen that is wrapped around it in a certain way. And then you've got what's called the serving mallet, which is turned the opposite direction of the way that the parceling is laid on. And the, the serving is 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 a uh, uh, light twine called small stuff, uh, and it's uh, it, it's quite strong and it's wound up very tightly on it, on the uh, on the parceling. So the wire that we got uh, was luckily was covered with cosmoline. So we left the cosmoline on and just uh, wormed it and parceled it. And when we were serving it, there was so much pressure uh, put on it that the cosmoline was getting forced out of the end of the parceling which would indicate that it was really getting in there and it was staying there. And also we, uh, we used a synthetic line uh, for the serving that had, uh, that was UV resistant. So it wouldn't rot in sunlight and uh, maintenance would be much reduced. Yeah, that's another question I'm worried about is about 
more modern materials and, and it looks like here you are using a serving mallet, is that right? Yeah, that's a serving mallet on a lift. Now, if you notice the wire, this was nine, this is when Peking first got here, not long after. Yeah, you can see the condition of the decks. Uh, they're still salvageable. Uh, but yeah, I'm 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 uh, uh, serving the wire. It was a lift for for one of the yards, and um, because it was a rush, 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 you can see there's no worming or parceling under it. So it was just tarred and then uh, and then served. And uh, you know, it's a good thing you can't see my face because I wasn't real happy about that. Uh -huh. Well. Got the job done. So now we're getting into some of these innovations, jerry rigging things that we talked about. Uh, right. This is something you're pretty proud of. Uh, help me understand what we're seeing here. Yes, it's the only machine of its kind in the world, and it's it is a serving machine that uh, that we put together because. I don't know about anybody else, but after you've served wire for eight hours a day for a while. Uh, like I did on a lot of the waiver tree uh, back in the 70s. Uh, it gets pretty boring, you know, you know, round and round and round and round. So, you know, you got different tricks you can use. You can jump the wire and the, you know, the reel will go by itself, the hairy, the, uh, uh, you know, the mallet and the reel on it can go by itself. But that's tiring too. So the thing is to make something where you don't have to touch a mallet, you don't have to touch a wire or anything. So we have an electric motor, we have a gearbox, we have a sprocket chain, and that was that that turned another sprocket on top. That the um, if you go to the next picture, that had an output shaft, uh, which you can see on the right there at the shackle, and that's what the that 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 had a uh, wire on it, and on the other end of it, where you have that tripod arrangement, that was the terminal point, and there's a swivel there. So the wire, uh, you know, that shaft would rotate uh, at, at a relatively slow speed uh, and um, uh, the wire would be stretched between that point and another terminal point on the pier. In this case, it was Pier 15. So we could lay out a length of wire, you know, we'd stretch it out with the, the forklift and chain fall so it would really be taut uh, and, uh, you know, which was no easy task. But once we'd set everything up on it, you know, we'd worm it and parcel it by hand, but that went fast. And, uh, you know, with a couple of people. Uh, so then we'd uh, set up the mallet with, with, with its own spool and the mallet would hang and the wire would revolve uh, and the serving would go on. You would adjust it a little bit to get the right tension and, uh, you know, make sure that the turns weren't lying next to each other. And to, to do that, you would incline the wire just a little bit so the mallet wouldn't wouldn't drift away, and uh, turn it on, and uh, uh, you come back every couple hours and check on it, and you know load up another magazine of uh, uh, you know of serving stuff, and that was it. And so we uh, you know we served I don't know how many thousands of feet of wire with this thing, but you know if you know if I had to keep one or two people on there, we uh, you know the thing wouldn't you know the thing wouldn't make any progress. So, you know, there was enough work to do without standing around spinning them out. So. Well, I love it. What I love about this in part is uh, it seems like we're returning to the rope walk where we started. Uh, and uh, and we're, we're right at the end of our program here. So I, I love that we have that uh, uh, that little bit of a, a bookend in, in looking at uh, work with wire rope. So we, we've seen how it, it came to be constructed and, and developed. And uh, we see how you know similar processes in a, a very casual and uh, uh, improvised fashion are used to help with restoration. Uh, what? Uh, how do you want to close this out here? What? What are our last conclusions about what you learned from doing this work on Peking and and the perspective you got on uh, on wire rope? Well, the uh, um, you know it was a great job and. Uh, you know, as I said, it was the biggest, you know, the biggest job of its kind ever done by a maritime museum in the United States. Uh, you know, the ship is, uh, you know, the ship was home in Germany where she belongs. That makes me happy. Uh, you know, we had a piece of uh, preserving her so she'd last long enough to be able to, to make it to Germany and, you know, be fully restored and properly restored. And uh, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a great job. 
I, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, uh, if, if convincing people was as easy as doing the actual work, it would have been, uh, you know, it would have been a real, real, you know, a real pleasurable event, but it, it took some, you know, it took some convincing, but, uh, um, you know, you know, you guys are going to get sued, get another wire falling down. So, <laughs> So, but yeah, no, it was a great thing. You know, it was good for the ship and good for everybody. So, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll just cruise. Yeah. We'll yeah just here here is. Putting two cap stays up, right? That's me with the winch down there, electric winch. That's Stevie Geis. You're going to put the cap stay on. You see one cap stays already fastened. That's the gang around the uh, mast, throat seasons. That's the synthetic service. So we do get into new right. That's, that's how it's stacked around the mast, looped around the mast. That's a gang down on the deck there. All those rigging screws were refurbished. And that's Steve and Laura splicing a uh, wire on, uh, on Waver Tree. Fantastic. Well, Charlie, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and taking on this, on this tour of uh, wire rope and its, uh, its use. Uh, uh, I think that that last image with the uh, splicing wire rope looks utterly terrifying and I'm glad those guys were wearing some heavy equipment, but, uh, uh, and uh, best of luck to you with your, your program with the, uh, the Titanic project, the quiet seas. And, uh, Thank I you. hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, you know, uh, please be in touch folks. If you have questions, uh, we'll get, make sure they get to Charlie and we'll get them answered for you. But uh, we, we're out of time here. So we'll thank you and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, ha yeah, be happy to answer any questions. So. Much appreciated. Very good. Take well, care, Stefan. Thank you.